Our thoughts and feelings are our own and are not representative of Electronic Arts as a whole or anyone else. Once again, it's time for the Team Lift Podcast with your hosts, Brandon Bowie and Roderick McDaniel. Let's go ahead and get right into the show. All right, man. So uh, today we're going to do our Logan special. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you have not seen the movie, we're going to tell you now, turn off this podcast because we're about to break this thing down. We're really going to do, we're going to do a deep dive into it. Correct? That's what you wanted to do today? Yeah. Okay. So um, chances are, if you've not seen it, this is going to be spoiler heavy, super spoiler heavy. Um, Let's start off with this. So the movie Logan supposed to be the final installation in film in the Logan series. Well, we'll say it's the final film with Hugh Jackman in the Wolverine as, series. As playing Wolverine. Yeah. And apparently uh, Patrick Stewart is also kind yeah. of bowing out as well. Although he did say that he would be interested in coming in and being Professor X if he was attached to Legion, the television show. Yes. But... He does not want to do any more films. Yeah, I don't think that that's going to happen, to be honest, because that television show happens in a completely separate universe. So, like, Logan's in a different universe, Legion's in a different universe, and then all the other X-Men films, some of them are in the same universe, some of them are in a different universe, some of them are in alternate timelines. Like, the whole fucking thing is just messy all yeah. around. But so are the X-Men. But, yeah. I mean, it's... If you think it about is. it, the X-Men are one of the most fucked up timelines in comic books. Yeah. Cable alone just fucks everything up. That's another one. Deadpool's in its own universe. Yeah, but in the Deadpool universe, we're going to have Cable in the film. Yeah. Okay. What I'm saying is, like, Deadpool is also in its own universe because Mm -hmm. the uh, guy that we have playing um, the fucking big Russian guy. you know, Oh, Colossus. Colossus. The the guy that we had playing Colossus is not the same guy that we had playing Colossus in the previous X-Men films. And that's what's so weird because in Deadpool... I mean, we're getting off on a tangent here, but in Deadpool, he always talks about Logan or Wolverine. So we know that Wolverine, a Wolverine exists in that universe. Yeah. Well, he's, he's also, you know, making a bunch of references to Hugh Jackman and stuff like that, which means what's really going to be fun on the Deadpool side of things is when actors do change out, like when we get a different, um, Professor X and we get a different, uh, Wolverine and then Deadpool's like, where the fuck? Who, who the fuck are you? Like, he, he does those do referential that. jokes because he always breaks the fourth wall. And they'll just be like, what the fuck are you talking about? You're crazy. And he'll be like, you're not Hugh Jackman. Where the fuck is Captain Picard? What the fuck is going on here? Yeah, which is, that's, I think, what makes Deadpool such an amazing read. It's such a fun, <clears throat> it was a fun film. It's a fun comic book. So, mm-hmm. you know, we'll, we can't wait to see what they're going to do. Definitely saw... The preview I mean, for not, Deadpool 2. Yeah, see, it's not off on a tangent because that's like the opening of the film is Yeah, Deadpool we get a little 2. Deadpool 2 preview there. And that was one of the first things I noticed is that it, you know, Nathan Summers is coming was written on the phone booth. Mm-hmm. If you're paying attention, it's right there in big lettering on the phone booth. So we know, hey, he's mentioning Cable right here, that yeah. Cable's coming. So it is, or confirming it. Have they confirmed who's going to get the role of Cable? No, they're talking about... There's a few different people. There's a guy from like Friday Night Lights uh, that might get it, the the lead man in Friday Night Lights, or uh, possibly the sheriff from Stranger Things. Okay. I know I'm fucking terrible with names, so go look it up, IMDb. Okay, friend. cool. No, so there's some names attached. You and I had our personal pick for it. Yeah. You What was it? We wanted Stephen. Did we want Lynch at one point? Or were you the one that wanted to get Kevin Nash? No, not Kevin Nash. The the other guy. Uh, what's his fuck? Uh, the the general from Avatar. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, what is that bastard's name, man? Let's go look him up. Okay, cool. Let's actually do that. So let's see. So I'm talking about Stephen Lang. Stephen Lang. Yeah. And he was creepy as hell in Don't Breathe. Yeah. He would be a great Cable. I don't care what anybody says. He would be a great Cable. Yeah. I mean, he looks like it. All you got to do is just give him the scar on the side of his face and make one of his arms fucking metal and he's Cable. True. The only thing, I, I don't think that they're, I think they're going to go with a younger actor for Cable rather than casting somebody, unfortunately, as old as he is because they want to be able to do sequel and sequel and sequel. And you can't do that if your actor's fucking dead in like 10 years. Yeah. Not that Stephen Lang's in any fear of dying. Like the 
guy is fucking ripped as shit, but he's definitely up there in years at this point. Yeah, no, I, I could definitely see that, man, but I, I still want it. That's who I want it. He would be my, if I was casting a film, I would want him. Yeah. But then again, that's why I don't cast films, because I would not be thinking long term. I'd be thinking, get it right the first time. Yeah. Um. So, let's let's get into the film, man. Now, you and I both watched it opening weekend. Yep. You watched it that Friday. No, I watched it on Sunday. You did watch it that Sunday? Yeah. I thought you'd watched it Friday, because yeah. you were very passionate about that weekend. Yeah. You came out and you were very vocal about how you felt about this film. I watched it Sunday too. Yeah. Um, so I was like, dang, did he already watch it when we were talking? And so you said something. I want you to say it again. What did you, when I asked you, what did you think about the film? I best actor, best supporting actor, best supporting actress, like literally just all three of them. Um, so Logan, Laura and, um, professor X, they should all Charles, they should all be fucking getting Oscars this year. It's the best fucking film of the year. It's, it doesn't matter. Like you can take all the mutants out of it. You can take all the other things, and this movie would still work. Yeah, you said that. You told me that. You think about this. If this was a movie about a grizzled guy having to get a girl across a border. Yeah, and it's it's a western too. Like it's there's a posse who's going after this this person, and this guy hooks up with this girl, and they have to fucking get across the border, and he has to get her to safety where this posse can't get to her. It's it's a fucking western. In fact, the uh, the director James Mangold, um, he actually directed uh, a western recently, I believe. Really? I think I might be wrong, but uh, three ten to Yuma. So he has directed oh, a western shit, before. Bro, the that's an old that well, they, it's an old film that they redid, and the yeah. redo was amazing. Yeah, three ten to Yuma. Um, he also did uh, let's see, Walk the Line, which was the Johnny Cash Johnny movie. Cash biopic. Yeah. I remember that. So. And it it's, it plays out like a western. Like that's that's the only thing I can I can really compare it to. It doesn't. <clears throat> it's not a superhero movie. I mean, it is a superhero movie, but it's not. Uh, it's just it's it's a movie about a, a road trip, family, um, and then there are heroics in it. But that's not the point. The point is like they've got to get. They're trying to save the last of all of the mutants. Mm-hmm. And that's that's it. Well, we had Chris Marsh on here, and you know, we did an episode yeah. with him. And the thing that he said about it was, it transcends the hero pick genre. And I keep hearing people say this, you know, that it was bigger than a hero film, you know. And that's, um, <clears throat> I, I'd, I'd have to kind of agree with him. And mm -hmm. the reason I, but the reason I agree is probably different than most people. Um, my brother watched it, you know, mm -hmm. opening weekend. I told him, bro, you got to go see this film, and so. I think I watched it that Sunday, and I think he went Monday night. And then Tuesday morning, we talked about it. And he went to talk about it, and he, he his voice cracked. He, he got choked up. Yeah. And he, uh, you know, I lost my dad back in 2014. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, that, was, that was tough, you know, on all the boys and on my mom. But that was the thing that he said about the movie was that when Charles passed, or when Charles dies in the movie, he... He went through that with an ailing father. He was there when our dad was sick and fighting cancer. Yeah. And he spent a lot of time with him. And so that played to a different thing to him. Mm -hmm. You know, that was that, there was a different story being told at that point to my brother. And I couldn't understand why I liked that dynamic of that relationship, but I never thought about that connection that was like, that was a little too personal at yeah. one point, you know, where that story that, you know, where you're watching this guy who was, basically my hero and was super strong and 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 the picture of health and vitality and you know just a strong leader wither away you don't think about that and and i told you even after i watched it you know i'm 46 this year and i started questioning my own mortality you know <laughs> it was a it's a fucked up feeling to come out of a film and you start thinking about you know i know how hugh jackman feels when he said it takes a lot on me to do this role and it and I hurt. And I don't, you know, I'm not as young as I used to be. And this is a really taxing role. And I started thinking about, bro, I'm not nearly as ripped as Hugh Jackman. I don't work out as hard as Hugh Jackman. And my feet hurt, you know, getting up in the morning and moving around. I don't move yeah. as fast as I used to at 46. So you start thinking about a lot of things. This film really did make me kind of getting my own headspace for a little while. I loved it for that. I, I thought it was an amazing film. I thought the cast was amazing. Um, the story, as you said, was great. I'm going to tell you something, though, man. 
That little girl, Daphne Keene, the one that plays Laura, uh, yeah. X-23, amazing. I never thought we could find a young actress so young, or, 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 or just this young lady was phenomenal in that role. I mean, she nails it. She hits all the emotional points that you would want just for her to be that young and have that much range. depth in, the, in range in a role. Yeah. You just kind of like, this was not, you know, this wasn't a, a kitty film by any extent. She brings her A game with these heavyweights. She's on the screen with Patrick Stewart and Hugh Jackman, and you never lose sight of her on the screen at any point in this movie. Yeah. You know, just in man, she, everybody kept saying the same thing when we came out. When are we going to get an X-23 film? When are we going to get an X-23 film? And I, I've got more email about that. Like, hey, do you think we'll get an X-23 film? I've been hit up by a lot of people about that. Do you think they will? I I would love them to make an X-23 film while she's still as young as she is. Like, just fucking do it now and just have her grow up as X-23 on screen. That yeah. would be awesome. Like, do one now. Or do do one that'll come out in the next three years and then wait and do it again. And so, like, there's a, you know, like a five-year gap between each film. That way, she grows into that role over, over a long period of time. Right. And she has enough time to, you know, have a career outside of it like Hugh Jackman did. I would like to see, um, because, okay, there were some mutants that were introduced into this film. I wouldn't mind seeing a new mutants reboot. Yeah. I could definitely see where we get it with the young kids <coughs> and that they're talking to someone yeah. in Canada, which for comic book fans, I think what fucks with us as comic book fans is that we know when we hear X-Men and then we hear Canada, we think of Alpha Flight. Yeah. We know that that's the super mutant team from Canada. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were government sponsored super mutant team uh, that gave us Puck, that gave us Sasquatch, North Star. That's a, you know, a well-known team in comic book lore. Mm. Uh, who who were these kids talking to that they had to get to Canada? And so you kind of wonder. It would, it would have to be Alpha Flight or something. I mean, the only other th option that I can think of would be if, uh, what's her name? Emma, Emma Frost? From the Hellfire Club? Maybe, yeah. You think Emma was over there trying to start her own team, maybe? Or maybe she has some kind of a safe haven there. There's something going on. Definitely something there. I don't know what it was, but when I kept but watching it, but it, it, it would See, that's the thing is it would have to be something that would be strong enough to be able to rebuff that entire multinational corporation's fucking hit team. That's what I kept thinking. You're not going to bring these kids here and have this hidden and not have some, some heavy hitters there to handle whatever comes their way. Yeah. Because, I mean, they obviously don't give a shit about crossing borders. They went from Mexico into the United States, and they went across the United States all the way to Canada. So they would follow them to the ends of the earth. So there's got to be something on the other side that would stop them. I mean, even though those kids are strong, um, yeah. there's still a possibility that they could be taken down. I mean, they are just fucking, like, 10-year-olds. Oh, well, no, man. You know, even the little fat black kid that was running, man, everybody was rooting for him when he was running real fast. And I was just like... <laughs> He's getting caught. Okay. <laughs> As a fat black kid, former fat black kid myself, he's getting caught. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, what I found so fascinating about, man, these, these young kids, when they were kind of pulling them together, there was an older Spanish kid that was kind of the team leader. He was the older kid, you know, preteen. Yeah. I swear to God, if, if he would have said his name was Robert DaCosta, it was a wrap for me because that's Sunspot from the New Mutants. And I was about to lose my shit in the theater when he shows up. And I was just mm -hmm. like, just say Robert Acosta. Just say it. Just say it, and I'm done. You could have, I'll pay for a second ticket, right? <laughs> I mean, we could, we could go and look at the cast list and see if we can figure out his name. Yeah, I don't think they Rebecca, ever really say. Bobby. There's one person who's listed here as Lizard Boy, some uh, Parker 11, some white kid. I mean, he had a pretty major role, so he has to have an actual name. I remember when she kept naming off the kids, man. She was naming off. I know the little black kid was Bobby. And, and that was, he was like, he is cute. Lizard Boy was the one that was, uh, that he was one of the ones with the scissors that uh, cut his beard into the shape in the, near the end of the film. Yeah, well, they all kind of did that. Yeah, <clears throat> but I remember Lizard Boy, man. He just had that unique look to it. Uh Man, it was such a crazy ass film. I'm just trying to figure. Out. Man, I never see him listed. I don't see his name showing up anywhere in here. 
I just remember that when he showed up, I was just waiting for him to say, bro, if this kid turns out to be Robert, you know, Robert DaCosta, y'all can just go ahead and wrap this up. That's the new mutants mentioned right there. So yeah, I don't ever see him get his name mentioned. And he was a really like he, bro, let's face it. He's the guy that leads these kids. He's their de facto leader to get them across the border, isn't he? Basically. Yeah. I'm, I don't know if he was an organizer of all of this, but he was definitely stepping into the leadership role among the kids. Because at the end, he's the one that tells him, okay, it's time for us to cut out. And, you know, it was just, man, it was a powerful film. One of the things that they do is uh, it's just how he, you know, even gave um, Logan the money. You know, here's the money. Thanks for doing your job, blah, blah, blah. I just kept thinking, this kid has got it. Was it this kid? I don't know, man. That's a, I don't know. It does look like him, doesn't it? A little bit. I mean, there's a whole bunch of kids here that are just listed as mutant kids. Mutant yeah, that, that does happen, man. And that's uh, that's really sad because I know she kept naming off their names. And she kept saying, you know, she named those five names. And when she said Bobby, I kept thinking, oh, my God. Okay, is that Robert? Is that Bobby? You know, and then I saw Bobby was the little black kid. I was like, oh, well, damn. <laughs> that is not Robert DeCosta. But yeah, no, I really enjoyed the movie. I mean, that part, I just saw, man, we got the potential to launch a new mutants. This is it. They got it. They like, set it up. The the part of the movie where you know, I mean, yeah, they have the cursing and yeah, they have the tits right at the beginning, but the part of the movie where you know that the whole fucking movie is going to be awesome is the first time X-23 just sucks a bullet out of her fucking arm and spits it on the ground and then just goes right back, charges right back in and just starts fucking murdering the shit out of people. Bro. I'm gonna tell you when I when the part where I just knew okay they're not about to tame this down. Uh, when she's sitting in there eating a cereal, you kind of just see her watching. looking over the. She's watching the camera and then yeah. you just kind of see her looking over the back of her shoulder. Just she's steady munching. I'm like this dude is she's not stopping eating. She's steady munching cereal and she's steady looking over her shoulder over her right shoulder like come on up. And then she rolls that head toward that fool. I was like oh oh no. Y'all chose the wrong one to fuck with at this point. <laughs> so uh, I was like, they could not have done a better portrayal. And, you know, and I was one of those guys that geeked out about X-23 when she showed up in the NYX comic books back in uh, mid-2000s, whenever that was. I, I want to say that was 2006 when that comic book launched. I can't quite remember. Could have been later. But when she showed up in there as kind of like a teenage prostitute, teenage runaway prostitute, I was just like, holy shit, this is... They're on a whole nother level right now. They're they're about to tell a crazy ass story right here. And so it was kind of neat to see her there. But man, that story of telling her life and how they tied it together to Wolverine as her father. And man, mm -mm. couldn't ask for a better film, bro. I could not have asked for a better film. I could not have. There's a a lot of stuff in that movie like uh, that will just bring you to fucking tears too. Oh, God. Yeah. Like the part where fucking Charles is, is stuck in the the dome because he keeps having seizures mm-hmm. and like he's just fucking as logan's walking out he's like this is no way for a person to li- for a human to live mm-hmm. like that's just sticks a fucking knife in you oh yeah no <clears throat> that whole scene especially when he fir- when he has that first seizure and you realize why they're keeping him where they're keeping him to, to hide him yeah uh, my brother, the line that got him was the one where he was laying in bed and he said, I've had, this has been such a perfect day and I really don't deserve it. And that my brother said, dude, that line kills me when he says that. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I, I choked up when he said that, when he started kind of reminiscing and saying, I remember what I did. And I was just like, fuck dude, you know, this is uh cause once again, when your dad's died, he talks to you about reminiscing over his life and, and remembering when he has these days that were better than others, you know? Yeah. So one day, I'm, you know, I'm not hurting so bad and it's a good day. And so, you know, it was a really emotional, like I, 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 I'll say this, first of all, I brought baggage into this film yeah. that I didn't even know I had baggage of. And so that was one of the things about the film that I found the most fascinating was as I'm watching it, this film is speaking to me on a whole nother level. Because the story is telling about an ailing father and his son in the, in the future. There's a Lord basically is a, is a granddaughter. Yeah, that's who she is. You know, and it's just this this family. And he's you know he this is not a Wolverine that we've watched that kicked ass and was hardcore. This is a guy who is grizzled. 
who has seen a lot of death, who's seen a lot of pain. And is dying. And is dying. He is dying. He is actively dealing with his own life coming to an end while caring for an ailing parent. That's not an easy story to sell. That's and there and and unfortunately, eventually, everybody will deal with that issue. Yeah, that your parents are older than you, and you're gonna have to take care of them at some point. And so, um, I I, I felt like emotionally, this story was all over the map, but it was so fucking focused, like laser focused on this is what's important to us. This is the story we're gonna tell. So it was a superhero film, but it had so many human elements to it. There was so much more going on, and so much deeper than any other film, which. A credit to when you pick a guy who's an Oscar-worthy director. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the studio, the best thing they can do is get the fuck out the way and let him make a film. Yeah. Just kind of, you know, a word to DC. Let your directors make films. Unless that director's Zack Snyder, then throw him the fuck off the project. Because uh, he's going to ruin it. But this, <laughs> that's a neither here nor there. Um, just I was throw just him like, into a fire, maybe. Huh? Into a fire. Just throw him into a fire yeah because he, he just gonna ruin the film but man no there was some amazing stuff to this one um as far as the cinematography goes gorgeous film to look at in in cinema dx i did the the digital extreme version at the cinemark mm-hmm. loved this film it was so like when i look at films and it's showing like all this wild this wilderness and these long you know spanning uh scenes I'm looking like the last movie where I really got locked into the whole wilderness. I watched in 70 millimeters and that was the hateful eight. Yeah. You know, when you were looking at this wilderness, I found myself looking at the wilderness and the city and stuff going on in the background, just as much in this film as I did those, you know? And then there was the not so subtle wall, you know, <laughs> at the border, you know, yeah. El pa- I just thought, man, this is such, such a good ass movie. This is such a good ass movie. What, what are we it's like doing? I said, it's it is it is a good movie. It's not a good superhero movie. It's not a good like. It's just a good film overall. Like even if you never watched anything from the X Men, you don't give a shit about superhero movies or anything. If you just go watch it, just for its self contained universe, mm-hmm. it's fucking amazing. And that's why I said it will it will work. Regardless of whether or not it has the characters in it that it has in it, because it's just a it's a human story. It's not about like the end of the fucking world, although there are elements to it that that feel that way, like at least as far as the mutants are concerned, because they are literally killing all the mutants off like they are uh, putting supplements into corn or they've genetically modified corn and they are harvesting that corn and turning that corn into corn syrup and that corn syrup is then in turn keeping people who could potentially birth a child with the x gene active from being able to conceive which is killing off the new mutant population entirely and then they are systematically or have systematically before the movie started hunted down and killed all of the other ones that were actually alive and active so you don't know how many other mutants there are, but there's Caliban, there's Xavier, and there's Logan, and that's it. There are no other fucking mutants in this. Yeah. They're presumed all dead. And the only reason why these ones have been able to survive is because they've been hiding in Mexico. Oh, and we didn't even mention the fact that, like, the whole subplot of, like, Logan wants to buy this boat and take Xavier out to the middle of the ocean to live out the rest of his life on this, you know, boat that they're going to buy together. Right. Which just, that whole fucking thing gets thrown to the wind. Yeah, because if they're out on the boat in the middle of the ocean, <clears throat> he could have all the seizures he wants and nobody gets hurt by it. Yeah. And and one of my friends was like, he said, well, you know, they never really explained what the Rochester incident was. And I and I didn't catch it the first time, but it, they do actually. There was an incident where Charles' seizures, there's oh, a yeah. scene in the movie that takes place when they're in Vegas. <clears throat> and we, we kind of come to understand that this was similar like if you're listening to the news report it tells you this was similar to the incident in new york where this seizure was so bad and he sent out this signal that levels this casino you know with his psychic powers that people died yeah that there were people 700 people were injured in some and there were six or seven deaths essentially like whenever he has a seizure 
his psychic power activates and it gives everybody in the the reach the the extreme reach of his powers ability a seizure as well and everybody just stops and they can't move they can't move they're they're i mean can't it's struggling. almost like you know how uh, there's that scene at the end of uh, the other the the previous x-men film where magneto and uh, Charles show up and they just and Charles just stops everybody in the airport from moving. They're all just standing stock still. It's like that, but it's a fucking seizure and it kills people. Yeah, and he and there were some deaths out of it and 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 Charles even fucking says when he's fucking in bed, he's like, I know, like th- I know presume, what I did. I I, know, I I I don't always know, but I've no I know that I did something terrible. Yeah, and it was just been like, and it was so subtle. They didn't show you a scene. Yeah. They didn't have, they just, it was, they if just you pieced about it together, it. the news report tells you, Yeah, if you're listening to everything going on in the film, this news report is going to tell you, hey, this is similar to this incident where 700 people were injured and six or seven people died. And then Charles tells you, I know I did something. And he, when he's in bed and he's reminiscing yeah. near his death scene, and it's just like, it tears your fucking heart out your chest. That you're watching it, and you know, and there was that line that they say, you know, when they were talking to Caliban appears in the film, and they were talking to him, and and Stephen Merchant did a great job at that role. But when he's talking to him, and he says, "Hey, this is the greatest psychic phenomena in a brain that's going through Alzheimer's." Yeah, he he's going to lose it, and what happens when he loses it? And, you know, you don't think about Charles as that. Man, we've watched Charles Xavier lead this team and be a leader and fight everything and and made this great team of X-Men and and the Institute, and here he is. And that's the other thing, too, is, like, fucking Patrick Stewart went all out for this, too. Like, as much as Hugh Jackman trained to be, you know, Wolverine, to be huge, fucking Patrick Stewart lost weight for this role. I think he lost, like, 30-some-odd pounds just to play the role so that he could look you know, trunk and frail and, and, and shrunken, frail. Yeah. And, and man, he nails it. And then that, just that, that banter when they're arguing back and forth, man, that was just so much love, admiration and respect. And even when they were getting into it, mm-hmm. you know, this is a real testy father, son relationship is what you felt about it. Yeah. You know, and it's just, you've always been a pain in the ass kid, but I, but you're my kid. Yeah. And that was just like, oh my God, this is. Which is funny because, like, Logan is like three times older than Charles is at this point. Yeah. Because he was born in the fucking 1800s. He survived the fucking. Uh, the the Revolutionary War, the First World War, the Second World War. Civil War. He went through Civil, the fucking like, Civil War, yeah. Civil War, like, he went through Vietnam. Like, he's old as fuck. He's like three times older than Charles is, but Charles treats him like a child. Yeah. And, and, and that was the thing that I always loved about that relationship was that, you know, you really think about it, man, for this guy to be hundreds of years old, he really did not have a good emotional maturity. No. He didn't. You know, if you watch the, even if you just read Wolverine Origins comic book, or even if you watch the Origins Wolverine film, you understood that Logan did not have an easy life. It, shit went wrong early at age. He accidentally kills the guy who really is his dad. Uh, he finds out Sabretooth is his brother, and they both go on the run. So it was a lot of things going on in this film. I was, uh, everybody, you know, everybody comes into these films differently. I think there are some people that come in and say, well, I hope they follow the comic book scene for scene. I like this better than the comic book. Yeah. I like well, this film better than I did that comic book series. I think the fact that they called it Logan and not Old Man Logan, Yeah, that's the separator. Because Old Man Logan is one thing and even that is contained into its own s- smaller universe, universe yeah. within the Mar- the greater marvel continuity so that's not like logan on 616 in the marvel comics that's just you know him from an alternate universe and even then he does like universe hopping doesn't he yeah old man logan yeah yeah like he yeah. hops from his universe into another one and he yeah old man logan thing. is sick the is now in the 616 yeah because of shit that's happened in Marvel Comics, you know, and the all-new, yeah. all-different Marvel. And so now Logan has kind of been brought back as an old-ass man, great hair, kind of saved from his universe. And now he's back in our modern time. And he's like, what the fuck is going on here in this timeline? So it's it's definitely a different, you know, he's more grizzled. He's a little bit more hardened. Um, so it's definitely interesting. But man, with this film, with the Logan that we got, I felt like I got the spirit of old man Logan. Mm-hmm. And that 
I'm just not as spry as I used to be. That fucking first, that just that opening scene is the best when he's just drunk as shit in the car and they fucking start trying to jack his wheels and he gets out and he's like, what the fucking go away. He's just like, he doesn't even want to fucking deal with it. He's just like, please leave. Yeah, please. I'm trying to be nice. I don't even want to tear you a new asshole, but you guys got to go. And And then (laughs) and then he pops his claws and like the one doesn't come all the way out. And the other two come all the way out. And then there's that fucking painful scene later where he's just like the whole time I'm watching this scene. I'm just like, go get a pair of pliers, you fuck. He just grabs his claw and just pulls it the fuck out. Yeah. All the way. Oh, bro. Yeah. That just the fucking pain in that. See, I don't know about you, but I just kind of remember me going. (laughs) Kind of tightened up a little in my seat. (laughs) You already don't heal that good. Why are you going to fucking injure your hands? Just go get a pair of fucking pliers and pull your goddamn claw out. Yeah. Don't keep hurting yourself. You know, but then again, here's the thing. If you've been taking risks with your body and bullets and hurting yourself. He's been doing it for so long. It's it's a habit habit now. So it's like, this is muscle memory to do it that way. Yeah. Uh, I, I really, it touched on so much, man. And just... And like even the scene, the you know they're 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 driving through the fucking heartland of Texas. Basically, they're driving across Texas to try to get to was it Nebraska? Yeah. Um, they're they're driving across Texas and they're going through like the heartland of Texas where there's a lot of shitload of cornfields. And all of a sudden, these what you presume if you look at them, they're they're automated trucks. They're just grain yeah, haulers. The, the automated eighteen wheelers. Yeah, I remember they start those. going crazy and it. it when that scene starts, you think, oh, shit, they know where they are. The grain haulers are trying to kill Logan. But no, the grain haulers aren't trying to kill Logan. They're trying to kill this other family who's completely separate from the whole story of what's going on with Logan and with X-23. They're trying to kill them because they won't sell their farm because they're the only ones left who are growing actual real corn that isn't killing mutants. And that's why those fucking trucks go crazy. And it takes, you get through that scene and it takes until you get to, um, I think the, the house realistically, like when you, when your brain processes that information and it really kicks in that it wasn't about them, it was about the other family and they just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. What kills me is I'm going to say this. So when they show up and that's first of all, Awesome casting choices. When you could get Eric LaSalle, who was a doctor on you know, on ER for years, he was the black uh, surgeon on ER, and Elise Neal, mm-hmm. um, two two of my favorite African American actors and actresses. Uh, the when you get them to take supporting actor roles, your film is legit as fuck to me. <laughs> okay, because yeah. you are putting a lot of time into who you casted in each one of these roles. And just to get those two, man, to see him on screen again was awesome. But just to hear them kind of talking, you know, about here's this family. They're trying to do their thing. They're trying to do the right thing. He's trying to run this farm. And the whole time I see them there and, you know, Charles is like, we could stay for dinner. And I keep going. No, Charles. No, this is not going to go right. To leave. King, you, you're going to put this family in danger. This never goes right in any film. I don't want, I don't know where this is. I know where this is going. I just don't want it to go there. Yeah. And you see it coming from a mile away. If you watched as many films as we have, you kind of know you shouldn't stay there for long because these people have already, I mean, like remember when they go into the convenience store where they were here and they, God knows what happened to the convenience store clerk. I don't think it was a happy ending. No, it's the reavers. I didn't see a massage table, so yeah, you know, so you know they're hunting them down, and and everywhere they go and they ask questions, there's usually a body left behind, and so when they get there, I was like, man, this is going to go really fucking bad, really quickly. It was just so. And let's just talk about that because we haven't even mentioned him yet. Uh, Pierce, Donald Pierce. Yeah, Donald Pierce is a comic book character. I didn't know that at the time. Um. I went and looked that up later because I was trying to figure out where they would have pulled that character from. Um, felt to me like he should have been played by Val Kilmer 20 years ago in Tombstone. Like, it felt like he was doing almost an impression of Doc Holliday from uh, Tombstone. Um, I remember you saying that. Now, yeah. Boyd Holbrook, the guy who played him. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you watch Narcos on Netflix. I have not. But he's the DEA agent on that show. 
Mm-hmm. So um, to see him in this role as Donald Pierce, and it was just like, bro, it's just the it's. It was such an amazing amount of cockiness and arrogance. And here's the thing. I know this guy's a shithead. I know he's a bad news character. And I still never hated him. Yeah. You never hate this guy. You just know. But that's the thing is like, don't get me wrong. I'm 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 not saying that what he did in the in the movie was bad or that he was bad. Oh, yeah. He was excellent. Like I had no problems with it. But after the movie I was like, man, I really wish this was twenty years ago. Because I really would have liked to see Val Kilmer do this. That would have been Val Kilmer in that role. Yeah. Val Kilmer would have been Donald Pierce 20 years <laughs> ago. And that that way he played it was amazing. I, and, and I wouldn't mind seeing Boyd Holbrook come back to the X-Men universe, you know, in a different timeline in that character. He yeah. does a really great job. I wouldn't mind seeing him in a different timeline, X-Men. Even now we kind of know what happens to him in this film. <laughs> He meets an ugly device, but it's so amazing when it happens. But you're just kind of like, I don't hate this guy. He's just a badass. <laughs> uh, and that was the thing, man. Okay, let me ask you this. So we've got now two R-rated movies. Hero flicks. The superhero genre is now giving us yeah. two R-rated films. Both of them from Marvel. Both Marvel. One was Deadpool and this one, yeah. Logan. Well, wait, wasn't, wasn't Suicide Squad R-rated? No, PG-13. I thought they had reshot it so that they could hit the R rating because Deadpool nah, they did went PG. so well. They still were pussy. They went pussy on it. And they went PG thirteen. Yeah, and and that's and that's sad. Now, since this came out, uh, an insider at DC has come out and said, "Oh, I could see us doing an R rated film, but it's got to be the right the right character, the right content." You know, because they should we- just make a Lobo movie, bro. That's the only way they'll be able to make it. Well, okay, let's say this. We have two R-rated films in the DC animated universe. Yeah. Because um, the Justice League Dark, which is the newest one. And if you haven't seen it, great film. Watch it. Yeah. Really good film. Really a fun flick. Um, and then they gave us The Killing Joke. Yeah. But DC that's thing, animated films. DC animated films don't fuck around. I got to give them that. They're amazing. Yeah. I, I, lo- I have a collection of DC animated films. I can tell you this much. I'm happier with those more than I'm disappointed. There's very few I'm disappointed by because Flashpoint Paradox was a great film, you know, animated film. Mm-hmm. Uh, Killing Joke, pretty much everything in the Batman series has been great. So Killing far. Joke was good if you cut off the first like 20 minutes of it. Yeah. Where you go, I don't need yeah, that. But bad okay. choices. Yeah. But other than that, I mean, it was just like, and, and to me, the thing about that is we didn't even need that. I didn't need you to set up a reason. Batman cares about these characters they, because they're family. I don't need. They did. They did that on uh, for purely for time reasons. I don't know why the fuck they bothered to go with the love route. It was it was dumb. I mean, we've got a podcast on that, so yeah, we're not going to get into that. We we remember being pissed off by that choice. Yeah, yeah, uh, and thinking, well, that was stupid and a waste of time. Uh, but the rest of their R-rated films have been amazing. I mean, you know what? Let's just be honest. They're, they're R-rated films. Justice League Dark was a damn good film. I don't know what the uh, Rotten Tomatoes score is on it. I haven't even tried to look it up. But I just tell you this much. Bought it, watched it, have watched it several times. Not disappointed by it. You going to check and see what it's pulling? Mm-hmm. Let me see. This is actually going to be interesting. I want to know what it pulls. 71. Wow. That's actually better than some of the other ones. Yeah. And it's got a fresh... Oh, it's got a tomato score? Yeah, the tomato My, score is 71% and the audience score is 70 So it's the about even split. Like a, It's like a C-plus film for most people. A C-film. I really enjoyed it. I think you would, too. But you, you're closer to the comic book and some of those characters, too. Yeah. So I think you'll... I think for me, I had a better time with that film than I probably should have. Um, but let's get back into Logan. I mean, anything that you think they should have done differently? No. The biggest thing I've, I've heard people hit us up about, um, and I may have even, I don't know if I pulled this email. I mean, there were a lot of people who complained about the fact that they just threw the tits in at the very beginning of the movie to just be like, yay, we're R-rated. But I, that notion quickly gets dropped as you watch a fucking 10-year-old murder like 30 people and you know suck bullets out of her arm and spit them on the ground and then kick somebody in the face with a toe, like a six-inch long fucking... Yeah, toe spike blade. coming out of her fucking foot. Yeah, I mean, you you pretty much knew by that point in the film, man. Whatever you thought was going to be an issue, save it because yeah. it's about to get real. Um, 
I was trying to remember, we got an email and I didn't save it and I wish I had. Uh, one of the guys had written us and I remember just, his thing was that, I think he was really moved by the story. I think the thing that bothered him, and if I can remember, um, that there was no after credit scene. I got that what from several people. What the fuck after credit scene are you going to have? Fucking Logan's dead. Fucking Prof- uh, Professor X is dead. Is it just going to be an after the credit scene of their fucking bodies, like, in their graves? Like, yeah, you, well, they handled that during the credits. There was no way, to me, my thing I kept telling people was, what could, there was no way to do an after credit. It was I a mean, self-contained story. I that guess you could, you could do an after the credit scene of them being on the other side of the fucking fence on, in Canada. And like, you know, had Alpha Flight been there to pick them up or whatever, if you wanted to do that. But this movie was an end. This movie was not a beginning of some new thing. This movie was an end of two titular characters, you know, saying goodbye to this entire franchise. I'm glad it didn't happen after the credit scene. I think it would have just been, it would have cheapened the whole fucking movie if they hadn't after the credit scene. Yeah, I, I gotta give you that one. Because to me, there was nothing that, okay, why would you tease a series that we're not sure what they're going to do with X-23? We're not sure if there's going to be a new Mutants. We really, to be fucking honest with you, don't know the future of the X-Men at this point. Yeah. We have no idea what they're going to do. And there's still the possibility that somebody's going to pull their head out their ass at Fox and pull a Sony and let the characters be used by Marvel the right way. Well, some of that's already in, in the works. Like, we've got Legion, which is has the Marvel splash screen on it. And we have Deadpool, which has the Marvel splash screen mm-hmm. on it. And we have Logan, which also has the Marvel fl- splash screen on it, if I remember correctly. It did, but you know it wasn't really part of the... It's not a part of the greater Marvel universe, and and neither is Legion, and neither is Deadpool. Mm -hmm. But it shows that Fox is bowing to Marvel's leadership in how these movies should be constructed and how they should be deployed. Mm -hmm. Um, And that means that things are turning. Like The whole reason why we have Ego in Guardians of the Galaxy 2 is because of Deadpool, because they wanted to change the powers of Negasonic Teenage Warhead because they wanted a user, but her power set's fucking lame in the comics. And Marvel has full control over the creation of New Mutants and full control over the dispensation of their powers. So Fox isn't allowed to change any of the power sets for any of the characters from any of Marvel's comics that they own, the, the movie rights to. And so in order to change that power set, Marvel went, you give us Ego, we'll let you change the character and we'll put our fucking name on the front of the movie. And so that's how that exchange happened. And so since that exchange has happened and Deadpool has been successful, now there's Legion. Now there's Logan. Now there's, you know, whatever else is going to come down the pipe. But we knew this was going to happen when Sony got fucking paid to let Spider-Man go be in, in civil war. Yeah. But Sony was in a financial, Sony was in the financial position that Marvel was in when Marvel. So sold, sold Spider-Man the rights. That's right. the only reason why that shit happened. Oh yeah. No, it, it, the tables have turned, you know, uh, we're talking about Marvel damn near filed bankruptcy. A lot of people don't realize this in the eighties, Marvel barely made it into the nineties. Yeah. Marvel seriously was on bankruptcy's door and was about to quit publishing comic books and close it all up. And if they wouldn't have gave up that licensing deal and sold those rights to everybody so that those films could get made, there would not be a Marvel comics yeah. for just, us to discuss. If I could go back in time and fix one fucking thing that Marvel did back then, I would have sent them a lawyer that actually knows how to draw up a contract that has a specific start and end date <clears throat> so that at some point in the future, Marvel could actually get their shit back. Oh yeah. I mean, it happened, it, it happened with Punisher and it happened with blade and it happened with, uh, somebody else. It was one of their character, uh, the Hulk, I think, um, where they actually were able to get their shit back from the people that they sold it to because they reneged on or they, they weren't able to, follow the contract that was basically like you have to put out a movie once every so many years and it has to hit this many venues and it doesn't matter what you spend on that that property to do it but you have to do it which is the reason why we have so many fucking spider-man movies Mm -hmm. because after sony got the rights to spider-man they had to they had to put out one movie every four years in order to be able to keep the contract for spider-man on their side and which is how we got in so many shitty fantastic four films Exactly. The same thing's happening with the Fantastic Four. 
those rights should just go back to Marvel as well. Although I think Marvel, if they do get them back, they should just sit on that shit for another six or seven years before they try to do another. They don't even do a comic book now. Yeah, they pulled all the comics. They've they've almost completely shut down production on all of the X Men comics too, and they're killing off all the X Men. I don't know if you if you know that. Oh but... no, I'm I'm very active in collecting. Um, yeah. Let's be honest. There's a there, there. If you've been reading, this year started 2017. Started with a series called X Men versus the Inhumans. Inhumans. Yeah. And there's a giant cloud that's for some reason, even though they have a person who can literally control the weather, they can't stop it from killing mutants. Yeah, the Terrigan Mist, and it's fucking up everything and everybody. And and there's a lot of stuff going on, but we also know that Marvel changed up the rules. So we know that, you know, there are no Fantastic Four comic books. I was really upset by that. I was really happy to see Ben Grimm show back up. Where he showed up is kind of weird. He's now part of the Guardians, which... He plays really well in that role. You don't think about it, but if you look at the Guardians of the Galaxy, if you put Ben Grimm, the thing, in there with them, how I mean, do you know he's not a fucking it's a alien? a team made up of a tree, a green guy, a fucking raccoon, a human, and... Gamora. Gamora. And a badass alien assassin with green skin. Yeah. And let's be honest, the thing works in that group really well. Yeah, he fits in. <laughs> Yeah, he just fits in. It's really worked. Like, first time I saw it for the comic book, I was like, why is the thing in the Guardians of the Galaxy? Let me just buy this issue. Well, shit, this makes sense. This works. See, like, that's the thing is, like, Ben Grimm is one of those characters who you could see drinking in a seedy bar on a space station in the middle of fucking nowhere with a zillion aliens around him. And he looks like he's supposed to be there because everybody else looks fucked up, too. <clears throat> Yeah. Whereas, like, when he's on Earth, everybody's human and he's a big rock monster. And it just it doesn't work. Yeah. And well. which is, and the thing is that I've always liked in the comic books that him and Logan were always really close, close and they were drinking buddies. Mm -hmm. You know, there's many a comic book shot of those two in a bar knocking back scotches. And you're just like, that makes sense. <laughs> These two drinking whiskey in a really seedy, ugly dive bar just makes sense to me. That's my Marvel. But uh, yeah, I was really impressed with that. So it's, I, I can see where they're going. They're basically, we're going to get our properties back if we have to kill it and tank every one of these stories. Yeah. We'll tank this whole damn thing and you'll have to give them back. Because Fantastic Four hadn't had a comic book now in a little over a year. They got nothing. Yeah. And, and like I said, Ben Grimm just now showed up in The Guardians, which pretty much is owned by Marvel. And unless they make another, I wouldn't mind seeing him show up in, uh, if, if Ben Grimm was the only character that showed up in the uh, Avengers Infinity Gauntlet, I wouldn't even give a shit. I could be so happy with that. I could be so happy with that. That wouldn't even bother me. You wouldn't even need the Fantastic Four. Just give me Ben Grimm. Give me Ben. Give me the thing in his Rocky gloriness and I'll be happy. I was just saying. No, I doubt it'll happen because I'm pretty sure. Who owns that? Is that Paramount that has the rights? To, or is it 20th Century Fox that also that keeps was, fucking up? I thought it was Sony. Sony doesn't know Fantastic Four. Uh, I think they do. I might be wrong, but... Yeah, oh no, I'm going to this one. <laughs> I just want to see who did... Let's see, Fantastic Four. The only film to get a nine on its Rotten Tomatoes. A nine. Bro, you don't even have to try to, to get a nine. Mm, 20th Century Fox. Hmm. Distributed by 20th Century Fox. Boy, they have figured out how to screw that up. Hmm. They have really figured out how to screw that whole series beyond... Uh, is it... Let me ask you this. Is it beyond repair? The Fantastic Four? Mm-hmm. I, I think it's beyond repair <clears throat> right now. I think if they give it some time, like if they wait like six or seven years and then they release another Fantastic Four, it'll be okay. Then again, I also kind of think that Fantastic Four doesn't really make any sense in today's comic book environment, like, like landscape, because it's so fucking old school that there's no... The values and the uh, environment that created the Fantastic Four doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. And I, it's really hard to sell that now. I mean, it was even hard to sell that when they first made the first Fantastic Four, which had, you know, Captain America in it. It's just, here's my thing. We get a comic book about a family who yeah. travels in space, you know, a girl, her brother, her husband, and the guy who, who kind of had a crush on her, Ben Grimm, had a crush on Sue. Yeah. Um, but they were, they were all tight. You know, they were 
friends and family, and it's we get exposed to radiation and we come back fucked up. We got these superpowers, but he's brilliant. He has this great mind and they create this team and he's a scientist and they're kind of celebrated in New York. They're the first family in New York. It's, it's a really weird. It's corny. It's super corny. That's the reason why it doesn't sell. Yeah, no, it's hard. And you can't, and people were like, when they made the new film and they said, well, it had a dark tone. It's hard to make that. The dark tone was from all the feces that Josh Trank rubbed all over his face while he was trashing that doctor's house in Louisiana that he was staying at. Yeah, man, dude, it's, it, he, this was. It was a shit show from start to finish. They shouldn't have done it. Dude, the 36 Golden Raspberry Ro- Awards, which are like for worst films, you know, the yeah. ra- anybody that watches a lot of film knows about the Golden the Raspberries. Razzies. This film won worst director, worst prequel, worst remake, worst ripoff or sequel, and worst picture, and it tied with Fifty Shades of Grey. It was also nominated for worst screen combo and worst screenplay. Yeah. It All was, around it was bad. It was terrible. Which makes me sad because, like, he was he was such a good director in Chronicle and they had such a good script in Chronicle that was written by Max Landis and I I don't I think that that first movie Chronicle that's a lot like the first Star Wars movie mm-hmm. in that it wasn't the director who was really good it was all the people who are around him yeah that were propping him up and collectively they made a good film but once you take him out of that environment and you plop him in the middle of a fucking $200 million feature film, that's when he just falls the fuck apart because he wasn't the thing that was carrying the movie. Everybody was carrying the movie. All right. It's like Star Wars wouldn't have been Star Wars if it hadn't have been for the editing. Because like the movie is, is complete schlock, but the editing and the soundtrack are the things that elevated it into... Cultural that's, icon. That's a com. It was a combination of a lot of things because I watched yeah. it as a kid with my parents, right? And so, not only this movie was no different than any other cheesy ass movie I watched, you know, space flick. Mm-hmm. It was basically an old school western. Yeah, the kid out of nowhere, the old gunslinger taking him under his wings, and Ben Kenobi. It's all it is, but it made you care the real about question. that universe and the people in it. You wanted to know more about it. It's it was all the right actors, all the right writing, the music. I mean, let's face it, fucking that music is iconic in and of itself. You hear that music and you know what you're about to get well, into. I mean, that music was written by a man who lost an Oscar to himself. Yeah. So if that gives you any idea of the caliber of fucking musician that you're dealing with, um, but I think the real question is why are westerns so fucking good, but so little of them are made. That's such a good question. Logan's essentially a Western. You you just said it. Star Wars is essentially a Western. Firefly was Western. a Western. Like there there are all these great examples of amazing Westerns that just and Cowboy Bebop. Yeah, let's talk about Westerns that we know were nominated for Oscars. True yeah. Grit, yeah. The Unforgiven, Tombstone, Deadwood. Yeah, we love Westerns. We love this idea Fucking of West World. Yeah, Jesus, I just mean, blew up. You know, just people were crazy over Westworld. So we know people, there's there's a romanticism with the Wild West and the Old West. Yeah. We, we, we have this unspoken of love affair for it. But at the same time, you make a film called The Long Ranger and it sucks. <laughs> it just, you, nobody wants that Western. We want there, the gritty. There has to be meat on the bone that people actually want to, to eat. Yeah. Like that's the problem with fucking that movie. I, and Disney is just going insane making these fucking live action versions of all of their films. So like Disney's found a way to reinvent itself by just making live action versions of all the shit that it made cartoon versions of over the past like fucking 60 years. I hate to say that's their new thing. Yeah, it is. And I've said that last year Um, until I saw the jungle book. Yeah. And I watched the cartoon as a kid and then I saw the live action version and then I went, holy shit, this live action version is so much better than that cartoon. I watched as a kid. It That's, was. It wasn't even in the same category of a film. I think the part of that is just the magic of John Favreau. You know what? Can we just go ahead and say probably one of the most underrated, underappreciated directors in in Hollywood right now is John Favreau. I don't see how he would be underappreciated. I mean, he made. He gave the us Jungle Iron Man. Book. He gave us Iron Man. He gave us a great character in Iron Man too. Just in in all the Iron Man films, happy. Yeah, 
And let us not forget Swingers, which made Swingers. Vince Vaughn a, a household name. Yeah, but he didn't direct that. He just he he wrote the script and he starred in it, but he didn't direct that. But man, but he's, he heavily influenced it. And and that's my thing. It's like, but people, when we talk about some of the greatest directors, you never hear his name come up. You won't even think of John Favreau if I, if we have this conversation in three weeks and I say, name some of the greatest film directors. You won't even think of his name. But that guy does not give you bullshit. Yeah. He steps up. He steps up big. He gave. He is the reason that we have a Marvel Cinematic Universe just off of the success of Iron Man. Yeah. Let's be which honest. is a movie that they shot without an without a script, which is just really weird. Yeah. The Think- whole movie is basically improv, and they just kind of piece the story together, and it was still fucking amazing. Think of that. I want you to really just picture that. You cannot have a shitty director do that. Yeah. And give you gold. The goal that it, it lets you launch a whole movie universe out of it. So, to bring this back around to Logan. Okay. So, this director, James Mangold, mm-hmm. he also helped write it. What other Marvel Universe character would you like him to direct? Can you think of one? If I was going to get him. And I'm not talking about X-Men. I'm just talking about Marvel. He could general. take any any film in the Marvel Universe and bring it. This is going to sound kind of weird. You know what? I want, I want him to direct the Defenders. I was sitting thinking Luke Cage. If they Luke made Cage. a cinematic version of Luke Cage, I would like to see him do it. Yeah. <clears throat> or Ghost Rider. Give me a... I mean, it's not They've that already hard. got Ghost Rider, though. He's on He's on S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah, but man, I, you it's know what I mean. He's on S.H.I.E.L.D. The S.H.I.E.L.D. is good. Yeah. I, I'm not knocking S.H.I.E.L.D. I'm just saying that the film sucked. The film sucked. I mean, that's just because Nick Cage. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to pin that all on Nick Cage. There was a lot more to Nick Cage that was wrong about those films. There's a lot was, wrong with Nick Cage. Yeah, I'm not saying Nick Cage was a, a, a great version. I still don't understand how they were going to pick him to play Superman in a movie. That's I watched that's that documentary, Tim, by the way. Tim Burton was out of his freaking mind. Tim Burton's always out of his fucking mind. Yeah, he was out of his freaking mind. But that just to watch that whole documentary about the Superman that never was, I was just like... What I was surprised about was that they actually got him to come in and talk about the fucking film. Who, Tim Burton? Yeah, because Tim Burton doesn't talk to anybody. No, he came in, and it was just like, it was really amazing watching that documentary and getting the guys that were behind the scene that were doing the art and stuff. And it was just like, this film's scope was so far removed from anything. And it you talk about taking a comic book and deconstructing it and making it a Tim Burton film. He kills it on this thing. It was out of its mind. It was ahead of its time. Uh can I be honest? I'm kind of glad it didn't get made. I think everybody's glad it didn't get made. Yeah, it would have just been a Although, freaking wreck. The, the problem with it not getting made was just simply the fact that when it came time to do another Superman film, we got that Brandon Ralph abortion of a fucking Superman film, Superman Returns. And that was all predicated off of the back of... Well, you don't want Superman to look like this, and then them pointing to a picture of Nick Cage in the fucking Superman suit. But the the in case someone out there is interested, and we're talking about the death of Superman lives. What happened? It's a 2015 documentary directed by uh, John Schnepp. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's actually one of the guys who was the original creators of Metalocalypse. Um, trivia for you. Wow, so, did not know that. Go and watch it. It's it's really good. It's got Kevin Smith in it. Um, it's got Tim Burton in it, uh, and it's got many dozens of other people. It's just basically exploring this movie that was never made. Now, you do know that there was a... It's word out that there was a scene that was deleted from the film uh, that Jean Grey was supposed to have appeared in this film. In Logan? Yes. Oh, I'm glad they cut that out. Um, Because they were talking about it, the scene was too bleak, and they cut it out because of that. Too bleak? Okay, well... For a movie where fucking Wolverine is drinking himself to death? Uh, here's the thing. Let me kind of explain it. You remember in the Old Man Logan series, what happened was Logan was kind of tricked by Mysterio. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he thinks the mansion's under attack. Mysterio from Spider-Man shows yeah. that he really has some pretty fucking sinister powers. Uh, makes Logan... Logan kill everybody. Kill everybody. Yeah. And then he snaps Logan out of it to let him see that you just butchered the X-Men. Yeah. And that was the thing that started it, that Logan was actually who killed it. That was supposed to be the scene that Logan had kind of killed Gene. Yeah, I'm glad they didn't do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm super glad that didn't make it into I the mean, film. I mean, could, I could see Logan killing Gene, but like, I, I don't think that him killing 
all of the X-Men in this particular movie would have made this movie better. I think the fact that they were all dead and that we knew Charles had did something and that Logan, well, the wild card, had now become the responsible one was having to take care of Charles. <clears throat> I See, that's it. the thing is, I don't, I don't think that Charles had anything to do with any of the other mutants dying. I think, I think he, he did. I think he had to do with uh, a lot of innocent civilians dying because his sickness started while he was in, while he was on some kind of visit to New York, probably to go to like a United Nations meeting or something mm-hmm. like that, and he fucked up a whole bunch of people, and then the X Men probably had to come in and swoop his ass up and get him out of there before everybody killed him. And then that probably kicked off the whole initiative to end mutants by poisoning them essentially in the womb yeah. and then systematically using Reaver to hunt them all down and kill them. Definitely a possibility. Tells me a better story that way. Yeah. Tells me a much better story that way. And and that's my thing. If you can tell me a better story than the comic book and it makes me like your story more than the comic book, yeah, I'm, fuck yeah, do your thing. I felt like this movie should be continuity. I felt like that was the story I wanted to see from an old man Logan. The other old man Logan is, you know, it's pretty brutal. It's pretty bleak. You know, we got Hawkeye in there and they're on a road trip. There's some, you know, it's kind of an old man buddy comedy at some parts, but it's pretty a bleak, brutal comic. Um, I still like this version a lot more. Yeah. You know. It's 11 out of 10. Oh, yeah. No, seriously. Uh, seriously, great film. Nothing I could say about it. I like the characters that they did bring in. Although Caliban, I'm not going to discuss it. I know we didn't. We know that Caliban was in X-Men Apocalypse. Yeah. But he also was in Logan. But and these never are different really timelines ex- and they're completely Yeah, they never really explain anything. You just know. Go into an X-Men Actually, film going, they, hey, they're all different timelines. They did explain Caliban in this movie is that he was working with Reaver to hunt down all the mutants. He's the reason why they were able to find them and kill them. Right. And then at some point, something happened and he turned on them and started helping Logan and Professor X in right. Mexico. But they don't really go into why. Yeah. And, and it was, there's so and much. And then they tortured to the fuck out of him. Oh, my God. Yeah. That, that, that brutal... Just watching him go through what he goes through, man. But then again, once Stephen Merchant, amazing British actor, had no idea that was the guy from. I, it didn't even connect to me when they was saying his name. Oh, the British Office, yeah. an idiot abroad. I wasn't thinking Stephen Merchant when they said Stephen Merchant. Portal Two. Yeah, it, I didn't know that until you told me he was the voice. In, he was one of the voices in Portal Two. Yeah, he was, never rang. He's the first core that you come across that talks to you that's like on a rail and you're following him around the facility. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it didn't even hit me. Didn't register with me, but that's awesome, man. I think we covered everything on this one. I think it was a great movie. Uh, definitely, if you haven't seen it, um, Brandon and I are thinking about watching it again. You're still mm-hmm. on that plan? Yeah, I need I need to go watch it again. It, it's I don't do a lot of films twice in the it. theater, but this one is definitely one that's going to get two watches. It'll get my money. I watched it and then I wanted to go watch it again and then I I was I was about to buy the tickets and then I I realized how emotionally fucked up I was after this movie and then I didn't. Yeah, I, I couldn't have done it back it to back. Anyway. I could not go back to back. I am going to go back. Like I've watched a couple of movies. You know, this last week I did Kong Skull Island. Pleasantly surprised. Love the fuck out of it. Uh, I watched the new Sword Art Online that was only in theaters for one day. Um, I went and watched that Ordinal Scale. So I've really been hitting the movies up. Caught seeing the. Uh, from the producers of Despicable Me, you know, their their new film about, you know, a singing competition had Reese Witherspoon, Scarlett Johansson, uh, Leslie uh, Jones, uh, Matthew McConaughey, star-studded cast, Jennifer Hudson was in it. Fucking really good film. I mean, I was in a theater full of kids and I still had a good time. Um, went with a couple of my buddies, man. Uh, in fact, my buddy Jason, we went and watched it together. Um so it was cool. I, I had a blast with this film. Yeah. So I, I had to put in some films before I go back and watch Logan. Because yeah. Logan touched on a little too much stuff, personal and close to home. And, you know, and it was just emotionally, it's a wreck of a film, but it's so well done. And just for it to still, even now, I think a 91, we said Rotten Tomato score and a 90 with uh, the audiences. A 93. Yeah, it's still a huge, I mean, this game is. 92%. Rotten afresh and ninety three percent audience score, so super fucking high up there. Yeah, no, the, man. The exact polar opposite of anything from DC. Well, also the exact polar opposite of any of the X Men or previous Wolverine films. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Although, I mean the the 
previous Wolverine film, the one where he goes to Japan, that one the Wolverine. The Wolverine wasn't bad. It wasn't amazing. It wasn't Logan, but it wasn't bad. It's yeah, it wasn't watchable. Origins. Yeah, Origins. I liked all the way up to a certain point, and then I was like, nope. That certain point being Deadpool? Yep. <laughs> I was enjoying that film. I really liked Origins. I I had the comic book, you know, Wolverine Origins. I liked how much they pulled from the comic book and didn't change. I was having a blast with that film. And then they fucked that whole thing up for me. And I was just like, wow, this is where the last 30 or 40 minutes ruins a damn film. Thank you. Um, yeah. But other than that, great film great film and i definitely recommend it if you did stick with us through this podcast and you went through these spoilers with us you have to see this film it we couldn't we could tell you everything about it but you don't know shit until you see it and experience the emotion of this film and watch a theater stay quiet like silent it was just eerily silent even through the credit scene knowing that there was nothing there i'll put it this way this this way i was glad i was sitting in the front row literally by myself in in the front row Mm -hmm. because them tears man bro i'm i'm gonna be honest with you i got choked up and i fought it really well i mean i fought it i never wanted to wish i had saw something in 3d because had i had those dark glasses on i would have cried in that theater i'd have pulled my hoodie up dark glasses and let them roll i bit it back i was in the middle at a 2.30 in the afternoon showing, and the place was damn near sold out. And it was still probably the most phenomenal thing I've seen. That's the thing is I I like going to the Draft House Village because the Draft House Village in the front row, if you go sit in the front row, they have... It's far enough back from the... It's way far uh, from the actual screen. Right. And it's far enough back that they also give you recliners. Mm Mm-hmm. So you can recline all the way back and lay down, and just the film is just there above you i did the cinemark in pflugerville north of austin you know that's out there by round rock big thing about that that's the the big 70 millimeter screen that they do the extreme d or their extreme digital films on yeah that fucking amazing sound system that just shakes your seat it was such a roller coaster ride man when the fight started i was like shit man i'm sweating from these fights and i ain't through a punch but i'm sweating i loved it on that i do need to go i I, I haven't been to a draft house since uh star wars seven like i i I think it's no mad max i wouldn't watch mad max out at the draft house so it's been a while since i've been to the draft house i need to get back out there man i don't i kind of skip them in movie house and eatery i don't really hit them up as much i just kind of i want to watch a movie Get in, get out, and just do the podcast and not, and not spend 25 bucks for one person. So, yeah, definitely a good time, man. Guys, we always enjoy you listening to us. Keep writing us. We've been getting some emails. We got shout-outs to some people that have been hitting us up. Uh, Daniel Glenn, thank you for listening. We read your email and some of the, your suggestions. Uh, we're going to be sharing that with our guys. And uh, shout-out to Cameron, who's helping us with our Twitch. We need to get back on Twitch. We got to get our Twitch channel. We got a guy. We have a new team member for Twitch, and we need to get back on Twitch. Okay. Okay. One day we need to do that. (laughs) (laughs) At some point. All right, man. Everybody, we love you. Thank you for writing us. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Thank you for getting us to 11,000 feed hits. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Team Lift Podcast with your hosts, Brandon Bowie and Roderick McDaniel. Join us again next week as we discuss more topics from geek culture. Be sure to follow us on our Twitter page at GoTeamLift, as well as our personal pages at Coach Silky and at Bizai. You can direct questions and comments to us on our Twitter page, as well as find links to all of our social media outlets. Thank you for listening. See you again next week.